love is never past. But somehow all men feel true with me at last. But how we really gonna let far in space and time? Just a vision in my mind. I know just what I say. Today's not yesterday. Can all things have an ending? Okay, okay, don't let me get started. Don't let me get started with that. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, my beautiful, loving family out there. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the mental house with me, your auntie, your favorite on your daddy and your mama's side. <laughs> good you. how y'all doing? Whatever side of the diaspora that you may be on, I just want to welcome you to the mental house with me. Um, I'm hoping I get a chance to pump out a few videos today. Um, and I want to start this show by thanking each and every one of my subscribers for being out there. I appreciate y'all more than you ever know. And I also, you know, want to encourage y'all to support me in this channel. You know, I don't you know, really do. None of my videos are like monetized in case y'all wondering because they all will get, they get flagged. And I don't think I say anything that um, is controversy or, but I would say 95% of them are flagged, you know, so I, I'm not like a lot of YouTubers. I don't want to get up here and ask for donations or things like that. But however, what I would like you to do, support the channel. And if you can, you know, buy a t-shirt, and um, there's also an, uh, another free gift we always send when it, with it, whether it's a keychain, or uh, um, ink pens, whatever, uh, but we have t-shirts and caps for sale that um, have different slogans about what we need to do with our mental health, and when you, right now, you can order them through um, my PayPal account, just hit me up at uh, the mental house at artists for free, the mental house at, at, at gmail.com. That's the mental house at gmail.com. And, um, or you can go to my PayPal link. Okay. Which is free soul. Okay. At PayPal. And so what you can do is you can order, but I'll be giving a little bit more information. First of all, I'd like you to just tell me if you're interested, first of all, and then I'll just give you more information about how to download it then. Um, we're real slow over here because we just a lot of, uh, a few little volunteer older sisters. Um, most of um, uh, uh, the people that we had helping, uh, either they're not here or around anymore. And so it's just a little difficult. Um, in the process of doing access television. So there's a lot of stuff going on. And I don't mean to be as slow as I am, but I really have a, a nice vision for this mental health network, not just dealing with me, but with other uh, professionals that want to come in and talk about how important that our mental health is, because that is something that we don't really care about. And in the black community, it's more taboo. You understand what I'm saying? But we have so many people that starve for attention, itching for attention. I had to realize that is probably one of the reasons why I didn't, um, I, I went as far as I could go, um, not talent-wise, but in terms of how much I was willing to compromise myself um, in terms of chasing my dreams. So I realized that at an early age that singing and show business they're two different things. And I think I like singing better. Um, because the business part of it or the um, play too much into all of the personality disorders that we talk about, all those cluster B 
dynamics that we talk about in the um, DSM. And I noticed that. I mean, it was just so it was so rampant, and I I had been so used to it being indoctrinated in church that um, it was a very comfortable place for me. However, <laughs> here's this thing, you know, that always leads you to the truth if you keep living. That's all I can say. Whether it's love, um, something that you care about, you know, something leads you to the truth. And when you find the truth, then you have to examine your whole self and be authentic um, and try to be even more authentic than you have been. Especially if you're going to be a vehicle and you want to be a vehicle, you know, used to dispense information, you know. So what I'm and I'm leading this up to say I'm setting up the narrative or not the narrative, but the, the framework to talk about um, Reverend Jesse Jackson. Um, all, Dr. King and I have so many similarities. Not only did he die and get shot on my birthday, um, April 4th, I was born in St. Joseph's Hospital. He died in St. Joseph, Joseph's Hospital. And I just find those two things so coincidental. Um, or are they? So with that being said, that he, even as a child, I remember doing plays at the school um, regarding Dr. King because being in church, you know, performing or singing and doing stuff like that was kind of like second nature. So at school, you know, I would always put on little talent shows or little things that would... um you know, reflect the things that we were going through as kids. Okay. So at this, I remember Dr. King, um, life impacting me like no other. I remember coming home and my older sister saying, um, uh, Dr. King is dead. They shot him. You know, they, you know, Dr. King got shot and it was just really, it was horrible. So when I came across and I always, from that time, even from putting on plays in elementary school about Dr. King, because I think I was like nine or something when he got killed, uh, I always looked at Jesse Jackson as, you know, just like Dr. King's brother. Well, then that's maybe into the last five, ten years. Um, and now I look at him as a Judas. Because every great man has to have a Judas. You know, he has to have someone that is more narcissistic and more concerned about their image than they are about a movement or about, um, I mean, just really wanting to be out front. And their aspirations or their desires to be a superstar or the head honcho is really more important than anything. And when I began to uncover certain of these things about Reverend Jesse Jackson, I began to get sick to my stomach. And so I don't want to stay on this too long, but I think that it's important for us as a family because we have been misled for far too long. We have been taken advantage of for far too long, even by our own people, by our own people um, who they know better. But because of their thirst for greed and wealth and attention, they're willing to do anything. So I want to share this article with you. And it was from um, News Inside Out. Uh, God, there was, let me just start it like this, okay? Well-known JFK assassination researcher Ole Demogards says that they they have probable cause and evidence that show that Jesse Jackson was a key covert police operative responsible for the April 4th, 1968 Martin Luther King assassination. In the aftermath of the assassination of the Dr. King, Jesse Jackson continued as a post-King U.S. black leader, including um, running as 1984 through 88 Manchurian U.S. Pres presidential candidate. 
and from 1991 through 1997 for U.S. Senator based on his status as a covert police asset at the Dr. King assassination. All right. Now, there's an author and researcher. His name is, again, Ole Demog Demogard. He was the recipient of the 2016 Prague Peace Prize as documented probable cause evidence showing that Jesse Jackson, a.k.a. Jesse Lewis Burns, acted as a key police operative in the covert operation which resulted in the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in Memphis, Tennessee on April 4th. Jesse Jackson appears to have been one of the integrated covert assassination team that also included U.S. Army sharpshooters, CIA, FBI, and Memphis police that assassinated Dr. King on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel. You know, I'm sure when Jesse did this, you know, he probably thought none of this would get out. And he thought that those uh, people really loved him enough. <laughs> but nobody likes a snitch. At the end of the day, and somebody that will betray their own, they get it worse. So now they've decided, of course, in the last few years to unleash all this evidence about Dr. Uh, Jesse Jackson, which is fair game. Jesse Jackson's principal role in the MLK assassination, he had orders from the FBI to the Dixie Mafia chief, and that resulted in Jesse Jackson going to the Lorraine Motel manager to change Dr. King's room to 306 on the Lorraine balcony, okay? Old Demogod demonstrates that Jesse Jackson acted, at, acted as a messenger between the head of the Dixie Mafia uh, chiefs, the FBI CIA contractors for the CI King assassination, and the Lorraine Motel management in changing Dr. King's ground floor room 206 to the second floor balcony room 306. Also, that was the reason that was so our U.S. Army sharpshooters and other cable shooters could have a clear shot at Dr. King. The order to change Dr. King's safe room for one that was had an exposed porch went to Jesse Jackson. And that was via, of course, Flying Monkeys, a covert phone call from the Dixie Mafia chief's wife to a third party with instructions to change Dr. King's ground floor room to a more exposed room, 306. It has come to light also that in the defiance of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s dress code for the Memphis protest activities as planned, Jesse Jackson publicly refused Dr. King's order to wear a necktie. I remember there's footage out there where Dr. King is speaking about that tie. And he you know, Doc, I'm not putting on no tie tonight. You know, I'm not doing that. Well, which had been designated as a secret U.S. Army sharpshooter target code. They knew not to shoot anybody that didn't have a tie-in. On the day of the assassination, Jesse Jackson, along with his co-conspirator, police CIA operative Reverend Billy Kyles, who later admitted the shit on tape, he said he stood out the way so they can get a clear shot, were the only people in Dr. King's key inner circles not to wear ties. Despite Dr. King's public reprimand and argument with Jackson, minutes before he was shot, that he should go and change into a tie, which Jackson vehemently refused to do. Yeah, you think? Right there on tape. See, truth pressed to the earth will rise. All lies will be revealed. Okay? Um, now, here it is 48 years later. The real reason for Jackson's refusal to wear a tie and to comply with Dr. King's order <laughs> is now publicly known. Hell, he didn't want to get his head blowed off, and he know that uh long as... They knew that if the friendlies weren't wearing ties, that he would be safe. The U.S. Army sharpshooters and shooters were involved in the King assassination 
had been issued orders to only shoot people wearing ties, which included Dr. King, Reverend Andrew Young, and possibly Reverend Ralph Abernathy, Dr. King's presumed successor. This refusal by Jesse Jackson to wear a tie immediately prior to the assassination showed probable cause implicating Jackson as part of the assassination team and adhering to his secret code of no ties for conspirators. Kind of see why Barack Obama really didn't like Jesse Jackson. You know, I mean, because, you know, in my opinion, and, I, and I'm not that I'm the biggest Barack Obama fan, um, not only did he call Barack Obama that name, but Barack Obama was pretty privy to this information. And if no matter what your thoughts are, um, most people know that Dr. King was a sincere individual. And he loved. He loved. And he really thought he was doing the right thing. And to have a snake lying right next to you, a person that's so starved for attention, is so in need of validation. <sighs> Let me move on. According to the Damagard, the shots that hit Dr. King were fired by Memphis police officer Frank Strasser, accompanied by spotter Earl Clark, another Memphis police officer. With the U.S. Army sharpshooters or other backup shooters hidden in the cafeteria of the fire station number two, a nearby water tower, and another high building. Following the shooting at the Moraine Motel, Dr. King was taken to St. Joseph's Hospital, where, according to Ole Demogod, an assassination cable connected physician by the name of Dr. Breen Bland entered with two men in suits ordered nurses to stop working on that nigga and let him die. The physicians then spat on the victim, took a pillow, placed it on Dr. King's face, and smothered him to ensure that he was dead. It was designed the design patsy for this false flag assassination plot, James Earl Ray, did not fire any shots and had been handled by a mysterious operative code named Raul for over a year on trips through Canada and Mexico before the King assassination. As Raul managed and manipulated James Earl Ray, the COINTELPRO assassination of Dr. King and Robert F. Kennedy were being planned by a high-level cabal, most notably, of course, the great, sweet, fishnet-wearing FBI director. There's nothing like a, and I have no problem with people's sexuality, but the closeted queens, like FBI director J. Edgar Hoover, can be the worst. Yeah. That including the Bush faction of the CIA, the U.S. Army, and other national security chiefs. According to the Damagar, personal personnel involved in CIA's Operation 40, who has successfully carried out the John F. Kennedy assassination in Dallas on November 22, 1963, they were also recruited in the assassination teams for Dr. King and for Robert Kennedy. According to Damaga, Jesse Jackson, who acted as a national black leader since April 4, 1968, acted out of PSYOPs immediately following Dr. King's assassination, whereby, according to Andrew Young, he dipped his hand in Dr. King's blood on the balcony and smeared it on his pullover, creating a false image, false narrative that Jackson had been the last to hold him in his arms, which was patently false, according to all false witnesses. Eyewitnesses, I'm sorry. Jackson also stayed behind at the Lorraine Motel after all members of Dr. King's entourage departed for St. Joseph's Hospital, where the stricken and shot down Dr. King was taken and became the default de facto spokesperson for the world. 
National Media and the King Organization, which in fact promoted Jesse Jackson to a new national and international prominence. In fact, it was how within the Dr. King's inner circle that Dr. King had uncovered that, Jackson, that Jesse Jackson was a police spy and he was preparing to kick him out. Within the Memphis Police FBI CIA assassination team, Jesse Jackson was reportedly pushing for a quick King assassination date, saying King was on to him. So he wanted to expedite um, going back to Memphis real quick and all that stuff. And, you know, the ensuing years as a covert police asset at the Dr. King assassination, Jesse Jackson became the ambiguous default black leader personality replacing the authentic African-American leader, Dr. King, whom Jackson helped assassinate, would have been. Besides media and social organizations, Jackson was a candidate for the Democratic presidential nomination from 84 and 88, I mean in 1984 and in 88, and served as a shadow U.S. Senator for the District of Columbia, 1991 to 1997. Positions he reached as a result of his status as a covert police asset in the Dr. King assassination. You know, um, oof. you know, many independent researchers have documented the extent to which the CIA and other federal agencies infiltrated the House Select Committee on Assassination, such that the truth of these four key political assassinations which began with a coup d'etat in America with the assassination on November 22, 1963, by CIA Operation 40 personnel at the orders of the high-level conspirators, including Lyndon B. Johnson, George Herbert Walker Bush, Richard M. Nixon, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover. And numerous power groups from which the United States has never recovered from as a modern democracy. Old Democrat has been invited to present as a speaker to the JFK Assassination Conference in Dallas, Texas in November of 2016. Donations to support his research can be made at the website below. Um, for all who are interested in the life and times of Dr. King and who question our government's official word on Dr. King's assassination, this will be an important presentation. For more detailed information, um, click below. Well, of course, you can't click below, but um, click to hear Dr. Gary Nill's Goblo press conference with Dr. William Pepper, attorney for James Earl Ray, regarding the Martin Luther King assassination. So you can even go to the Gary Nill show. That's the Gary Nill show. Um, and you will hear a lot more of um, this filth from somebody that helped kill the king of love. And here it is all these years later. Jesse has been exposed for what he is. You know, this is very hurtful. And um, even for those of us in the community that know that we're being attacked from without, 
we're being attacked from within with a subculture. And then when we put people in office or when we think that people are there to represent our best interests, we really find out that they are agent provocateurs, CIA, uh, FBI operative agents. And so it's really difficult um, to have any kind of true trust in America living up under this structure. And um, what Dr. King realized was that he had a snake in his grass, but he didn't cut it down fast enough. And um, every leader has a Judas. So um, I wanted to really get that story off, you guys. If you Just tell me what you think below. Leave a comment and share, subscribe. I'm going to see y'all a little later next time in the mental house. Bye-bye. Women, but that's why he got that nickname, Messy Jesse. Sorry about that. I'm just sorry.